Okay. It being six o'clock, I call the meeting of the Chelmsford School Committee to order. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. <clears throat> This meeting is being live streamed by Chelmsford Telemedia and posted to the Chelmsford Public Schools website for interested community members to access and watch. In-person public participation will be taking place tonight in accordance with the Chelmsford School Committee public participation guidelines. Anyone speaking tonight during the public input portion of the meeting has notified the superintendent's office of their desire to speak and has been provided with these guidelines. Upon request, Written comments received no later than 12 p.m. on the day of this meeting will also be read and made a part of the record of the meeting during the second public input comment session. Are there any members of the press here tonight? Not tonight, okay. Uh, so welcome to tonight's meeting. Our first order of business is to approve the minutes from our meeting on April 11th. I make a motion to accept the minutes from our meeting on April 11th. Right. Does anybody have any uh, corrections? No. You need a second. I'm going to. I'm, I'm going to second. Sorry. I'm going to second. Thank you so much. And abstain from voting. <laughs> okay. Thank you. I apologize. It's okay. Um, any other corrections or comments? Okay. Um, then um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Are you going to abstain? Did you say? I'm abstaining. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Donna. <laughs> it's nothing like town I meeting. I apologize <laughs> to you. <laughs> Just make us be a little fuzzy. Three, um, three, two, uh, three in favor, one abstaining. All right, our first, um, let's see, oh, we have our Chelmsford High representative. Thank you for joining us tonight. Um, and would you like some, to share some news? Yeah. So hello, everyone. So first off, just before spring break, on Thursday, April 13th, Governor Maura Healy visited Innovation Pathways classrooms at CHS, where she also announced Innovation Pathways desi designations to 27 schools statewide. And on Wednesday, April 12th, also before spring break, um, CHS AP chemistry students won the ACS chemistry quiz bowl against other schools at UMass Lowell, so congrats to them. Um, spring sports registration is open for the spring sports season. And finally, the grade four instrument test drive is set for this Saturday, April 29th. Thank you very much. Did you get a chance to meet the governor? No, I did not. All right, um, do we have any good news? I know that that was going to be our good news. Are you sharing know? good news tonight? Yes. Does anybody else have any good news to share? Just the, the fact that um, last night at the town meeting, we our budget for next school year is approved overwhelmingly. Uh, so thank you to the town meeting reps and the town officials for, uh, for the support again. Yeah, that yeah. was very good. I wanted to say thank you as well. Yeah, no, I thought the um, town meeting reps have been excellent with regard to really supporting us, so that was good. I think the local operating budget as well as the capital budget because we had a lot of projects on there, so that was uh, approved as well. Um, so, no, it was very good news last night. Thank you. And I was very impressed that our town manager listened to the presentation on Chapter 7A. Mm -hmm. It was great. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wanted to, if I could, just say one thing. I had... Um, some people approach me why I wasn't at the last meeting and questioning whether I maybe, because it was an organizational meeting in our first meeting. So I just want to publicly let people know that it just because there was a death in my family and I wasn't able to attend that meeting, I totally agree with all the positions that are on the committee and I am very happy and congratulate everybody. And Susan, welcome aboard. So glad to have you. So I just wanted people to know that. Thank you. All right, any other news? All right, so we're um, now to our first public input session. Do we have any registered speakers? We don't. Okay. All right, um, moving on to new business. New business. And first up, we're going to have uh, John Morris, who is our science coordinator, K-12 uh, for the district, talk a little bit about what's happening in the science department. So welcome, John. Thank you very much for having me. Glad to be here. Uh, so I'm excited to be here tonight, and I believe it's actually been a couple years since I've been here to talk about what's been happening within the science department uh, without the district. Uh, so what I'm going to talk about tonight is we're going to look through all three levels. Uh, we're going to look at some elementary curriculum revisions. I'm going to highlight some new middle school activities that I've uh, been able to witness and help implement uh, within grade seven specifically, and a little bit about what's um, 
happen with grade five. Then finally, I'll talk about some changes <coughs> with our curriculum and experiences for students at the high school, which relate to career and college readiness, specifically our new life science innovation pathway, which we just heard about uh, a couple minutes ago. So up first, uh, we've had some changes in K-4 science. So <clears throat> you might remember about five or six years ago, we were in the process of rolling out the adoption of our FOSS science curriculum. And we have three uh, overarching units per grade level in K-5. And the idea was we're going to do one kit, which is one of these units, per year over three years. Well, that third year was actually the COVID year. So what ended up happening is that was a life science unit. So that kind of got put off. And then it wasn't actually until last year we were able to fully implement what that unit looked like. So just to give a little bit of an overview of that, each of these kits, they have two to four boxes of materials. It's a lot of materials. Believe it or not, this curriculum for each kit, when you add it all up, can cover more than 100 days of actual content. So one of the things we had to do is really streamline the investigations and say, OK, what is the best options for our students to have these experiences that are also relevant to the state frameworks? But we also want the kids to dive deeper and have more efficiency with what was actually happening in the classroom. The elementary teachers will tell you there was so much they were trying to cover, it was just more of a breadth approach. So it's like, how do we really dive down and really dig in so the kids can learn more about those specific topics? At the same time, we're really trying to address how can we have overlaps between subject areas? How do we look at the literacy component? So a student might have an investigation that happens in science, but then they might have also read about it in another part of the day. So in order to make some of these changes more efficient, uh, Stephanie Quinn has been tremendous to work with. Uh, we've really looked at the pacing. So the science experience for students in elementary and the social science experience is the same block. So we had chances where like, the kids would alternate between a week or a month. So Stephanie and I sat down and said, OK, how can we really roll this out so that the students have a really correct approach? So what we decided to do was break it up where we'd have an entire social science unit then we'd have an entire science unit, so an entire kit, and we'd repeat this two more times throughout the year. And so far, the feedback, and this has all happened this year, so far we've had nothing but positive feedback on it. The staff really like the idea of saying, I have all of these materials for social science, I can execute the whole unit, the students really dive in, they get a lot out of it, then we can switch gears to science, and the same thing happens. It isn't like they have to have prep and setup that comes out for one part of a science kit, then we put it away for social science, everything happens at once, then we move on. Um, this upcoming summer, we've talked a lot about how do we look at the student performance now that we've had these changes, look at some of these common assessments that they had and say, okay, did this approach work? Are there gaps that we have to address? Are there investigations we might have to take a little bit out or do we have to add different materials or experiences for the students? Finally, uh, with regards to the standards, this approach has also allowed us to really focus truly on those core state standards where there's a lot of elements of the FOSS curriculum that can extend, which is phenomenal. But these, uh, these changes in this approach has really allowed us to say, OK, we're hitting the uh, main frameworks within the science in grades K to 4. So it's, um, it doesn't seem like it's a large change, but we've had a lot of good benefits that have come out of it. So one thing that's coming up going forward, uh, <clears throat> a lot of this work, uh, Ms. Quinn and I, we meet monthly uh, with each elementary school. So the first week we go. Um, Harrington, then Center, then South Road, then Byam. So Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, we meet before school. Staff can show up. Any questions they have, I mean, obviously they can reach out to us, call, email, you name it. Uh, but being in the buildings uh, before school, you know, we have, we keep track, people coming in. It's a range of things from, you know, might be missing maps in social science to I have a question about how did this assessment work online uh, for grade four science. Um, these common assessment updates, as I said, we're going to keep looking at this. Uh, the state is releasing some new types of assessment, which I'll talk a little bit more about um, at the middle school level. And then the other big thing that's happening with science curriculum is storylining. And this has been something that has been uh, working the last few years, but part of a network group that I'm in within the state, uh, there's a lot of professional development that comes out of this. So how I take that professional development and then find a way to make it work uh, with all uh, excuse me, elementary staff. And at the same time, you want to have student relevancy to it. Some of these storyline approaches that you get, you read them and you realize this is really relevant to somebody who might live in a totally different part of the country where some kids from Chelmsford might look at this and say, I don't really know if I can grasp into this yet. Uh, so how do we take that? And we're doing this actually as a state, a lot of the science coordinators together and saying, all right, let's look at it from the New England region and how can we make this work? Uh, so it's been, it's been exciting at the elementary level. Uh, at the middle schools, uh, there's been a lot of new activities, especially in grade seven. Uh, and I think 
one of the things people always say is, well, why are we doing so many different new things? Well, we've tried to find different ways to link the community, specifically, when I say community, not just Chelmsford, but even local organizations, into what's happening in the actual science investigations within the classroom. What does this allow us to do? This really allows us to integrate better hands-on experiences for the students, and we also get to look at topics in a very, very current, relevant way. And this allows us to say, what are the skills that kids have to know, but also what are those concepts that kids have to remember? And the benefit of this, this actually links to the new high school programming that we have with the Innovation Pathway. There's a lot of research out there now that shows, traditionally, like when I was going through high school, your high school experience would actually help you choose whether or not you wanted to do STEM after high school. There's more and more research showing that this is starting to trickle down into the middle school level where what happens in a seventh or eighth grade classroom and actually push that student to say, I'm going to really do this through high school and beyond. So uh, in terms of these activities, I just want to move to the, no, that's fine. I was listening to you. It was so intense. Oh, man. <laughs> so some of us might remember this. And even up until recently, you might say you know, the genetics that would happen in a middle school classroom, you'd have um, different genotypes and figure out what is the percentage that, you know, that this could happen. You'd have your food webs would have the little arrows. Sometimes you'd have a somewhat odd picture. Uh, where students would have to figure out uh, different trophic levels and even basic circuits. Uh, even, even when I was teaching physics, it was, you know, here's a wire, here's a bulb, here's a battery, make it happen. And this has been happening. It still happens in a lot of classrooms. So we said, how do we make this more relevant? How do we make this more current? So the first one that we did is we looked at genetics. And what you see here is this is actually from a seventh grade classroom. So that we actually have students... Every seventh grade student is actually micropipetting. They're using basic biotechnology skills in every middle school classroom, which to the best of our knowledge, that's not really happening in too many other places, which is phenomenal. So what they actually do is they learn how to use micropipettes. They're actually um, doing different colored dyes and they're doing little pictures with it. So there's a little bit of an artwork towards it. And they're learning how this goes with gels which is actually an industry practice. And one of the applications that they do is it's actually called cat genetics. So the students will actually now look at that image I had before, but what is this percentage that could happen? The students are gonna be able to use this activity to figure out where are the parents or how did this cat get to form how it is? So they're actually doing biotechnology related work to learn the state framework. So something that we looked at 10 years ago at the high school of being you know, innovative from a biotechnology perspective is gonna be a common practice in a middle school classroom, which is, it's awesome to see. And the teachers have been, Phenomenal with it. We've had um, a few days of professional development with it, and they, it's, they've really bought into the idea of, you know, how do we do this? And it, I was able to observe one of the middle school classrooms doing this, and the, for the kids to say, this is, this is one of the best things I've done. Uh, even to hear a kid say, I felt like a doctor. That was one of the coolest things to hear, you know, a middle schooler say, because they felt like they see these tools, they, they see these on the news, biotechnology is a, a large field right now. So I feel like they're a part of it that was awesome to see. Uh, the next area, so food webs. Um, we were fortunate enough, we have our little sound bite there. So students before, they have these food webs, they'd analyze it and say, okay, what's actually happening? These are videos that we actually captured all throughout the district. So all throughout Chumps, we have trail cameras set up. So now our students are not looking at just a general picture. Our kids are able to look at what's happening around town at each school and say, well, why are there so many turkeys here? Why are there so many coyotes here? Why are there deer here? What's actually happening? So now our kids are asking questions to say, well, why are they behaving this way? And what was really great is that at the middle school level, uh, you might have heard about this on the news in Nahant, they had issues with coyotes. And there was a talk mm -hmm. about how, should we have a coyote cull? So one of the activities was, let's look at what they did in Nahant. Let's go through claim evidence and reasoning and say, how do the coyotes affect what's actually happening to other populations of organisms in town? Now, that next step that we look at next year is, how do we take that approach here in Chelmsford? Is there a same argument? Are there things that are occurring here in town that we say, why are there so many of this organism and not as much of this? So the students actually have, again, here's a local experience. Here's data that is literally happening. Actually, I think the McCarthy one was actually right out back by the parking lot there. but. Um, so again, they get to ask questions, they get to integrate it and really analyze. And again, this is real data. This is something that we're capturing, not just uh, giving to them. And then the last one that we had new is where, how do we had a opportunity to integrate more with circuits? And this again goes back, actually back to some of the biotechnology equipment. So basic gel electrophoresis, students can actually learn about basic circuitry. 
where uh, we have these kits are called bandit kits and how electron flow and how charge flows will actually make different colors and different bands move throughout a gel. So before they even understand how the biotechnology piece works, they're looking at just basic electronics and other applications. So it was a way for us to take a step back and say, let's, how do we incorporate another standard into this? And they're even finding ways they can incorporate density into this as well, which is a fairly difficult topic with students. So overall, it's a lot of, it's a lot of new things. It's been a lot of work, but uh, they've embraced it. Uh, coming up next at the middle school level, uh, assessment. Uh, there is a new MCAS innovative assessment that is slated for school year 26. Uh, they're giving us all sorts of fun information on that. Uh, and as you all know, we have the reconfiguration. Uh, how do we continue to look at our pacing guides, our common assessments, um, even the curricular supports as we make this change, which we're all looking forward to. And again, there's so many more opportunities for grade level cl uh, collaboration. I'm fortunate enough that I have a staff at the middle school level that really is collaborative, that really do well together. So uh, to see this at a department meeting or a PD, you know, frequently throughout the year is great, but to see it every day next year is going to be even more exciting. Uh, last but... Oh. That's a, just go, yeah, one last thing. So for curriculum, uh, as I said before, I'm part of a science coordinator network. Uh, there's frequently released resources. These come out to um, science leaders, come out to coordinators, administrators. A lot of these resources are leveraged with the staff. Uh, so this is not just stuff that I'm looking at in a vacuum here in Shelter. This is something that's happening throughout the state. And a refocus on the science practices, cross-cutting concepts, and uh, disciplinary core ideas that we have to really integrate uh, within the curriculum. And then the other thing that I did not have up there is how do we integrate more um, industry partnership? One thing that I don't have a picture of, um, the DPW has actually been in our grade five classroom as well. They've been able to share some insights of groundwater, stormwater, and how that relates to our curriculum. So um, we're having these elements where students are seeing not just the staff, but they're seeing people from local industry come in as well, which leads us to the high school. Uh, so... <clears throat> Some changes we've had career in college, I'm gonna focus more so on the new life science innovation pathway. And uh, where did this all come from? Well, at Chumsford High School in the Science Department, if I were to break it down from a college and career aspect, for the college aspect, we have several dual enrollment options for students. We have forensic science, uh, we have chemistry CP and environmental studies. Each of these are four credit dual enrollment classes, these are lab credit classes as well, which for some students, when they go into the college level, a lab can be a time consumer, so this is a nice benefit for students. Still offering a slew of AP options, uh, from bio to chem and bi sci, and two options for physics. Physics one is more of your algebra-based physics, whereas physics C is a calculus-based physics. On the career side, how do we look at specific skills? How do we look at what's happening in industry? What happens with certification? What happens with industry recognized credentials. So we have partnerships. We have partnerships with the Chelmsford Water District. Uh, we have a partnership with New England Interstate Water Pollution Control Commission. I think I remember that correctly. We just call it New Ipic for short. And they've been a tremendous help to say, this is what's happening in the field. Andy Reid, Todd Melanson over at Chelmsford Water District have said, this is what our uh, staff does. This is what we have to figure out. We look at our bio, biology activities, environmental science activities, chem activities. We're transforming labs and activities so that students are doing in class what they actually do out in the field. That really changes what happens when a student can look at data and say, well, how is this relevant? What does this actually mean? And one that we've worked with quite a bit is uh, mini PCR. A lot of the equipment you saw, biotechnology, um, that is their equipment. We don't have an official designated partnership with them, but they've been a tremendous resource with us from professional development to equipment, even to other resources. And what you see there uh, with an AP biology class, um, using their work and using some of their resources for our students to experience. So these things all came out from Innovation Pathway. So in Chumps to High School, we're wrapping up our first year. Going into next year, we'll have 28 total students. I believe it's 11 are current freshmen in the Life Science Innovation Pathway, 17 uh, coming on for next year. And in this pathway, students can go on to two areas. They can focus on environmental technology or they can focus on biotechnology. And this pathway has opened up a whole slew of doors for us. We've, um, we can actually go to the next one. This actually allowed us to get a capital skills grant, which allowed us to purchase a lot of equipment. We've made a lot of changes even within the grounds um, to the school uh, with a lot of support from all of you uh, and Dr. Lang. Uh, we 
renovated and basically uh, invigorated the science pond area, which is now used by quite a few classes uh, for data, for analysis. Um, and this is not just an isolation, they look at it throughout the year. Uh, we have a greenhouse, we're looking at using infrared technology, uh, a large magnitude of water testing. We're growing lettuce, whether it be in a hydroponic system, an aquaponic system. We've donated almost 20 pounds to the uh, local food bank for what we've actually grown with our environmental studies class. Um, Another, you see another you know, wildlife picture. We, this is how we got the cameras to get all these pictures was through this grant. Uh, chemistry, we have new uh, drop counters. So we've made some changes with different lab activities that we have. And then more uh, biotechnology equipment. And all this work did kind of pay, for, pay off for us, as you heard before break. Uh, the governor did come out. We had the governor, we had the lieutenant governor, we had the secretary of education and the commissioner. Uh, all together uh, to come out to announce the designation of 27 pathways. And we were fortunate enough that they chose Chumpset High School uh, to make that announcement. So um, it's been a fun ride. It's, I, I can't say this enough. The staff um, have been tremendous. They've done a ton of work on this. I could not even talk about any of this uh, without all of them. So um, it's, been a, it's been a fun ride in science so far. So I will take any questions that you might have. Does anybody have any questions? I don't have a question, but a comment, if it's okay. Mm -hmm. um, incredible, just keeps moving along and getting better and better um, from all the years that I've been in the system. This is amazing, I think, to have actual work going on and getting students really to see the basics of science in their own community and in their own lives uh, and making it relevant, I th it's great. It's a great way for them to be able to learn. So I'm glad to see that. And I'm glad to see it moving down into the middle school level. I think that that's really great for us going forward. Um, kids need to stay engaged. Yeah, totally agree. Terrific. And the cooperation you're talking about, it sounds wonderful among the staff and the teachers and um, that's the only way to do it, and you're doing it. Now, do the students still have to take a science MCAS? Is this so? Yep, so at Chumpson High School, our students take the biology MCAS okay. tests. And so and this plays into that file? Yep, so believe it or not, the life science pathway, um, it breaks down, you have to have te uh, technical courses and advanced courses. We designed it so that the technical courses are courses that every kid has to take no matter what. So from a scheduling perspective, this helps. So the caveat to that is we took these industry type activities and embedded them within those technical classes. So a kid does not actually have to be in this pathway to be getting these skills. So case in point, um, in our biology classes, every student is getting that second level of biotechnology skills because that is the actual, that's the content that relates to the standards. So it's a nice thing, don't get me wrong, it'd be great to be in the pathway to get more, but the fact that we have every student do that is fantastic. I have a question for our student rep. Have you had the opportunity to participate in any of these classes where some of this technology is being used? Yeah, um, last semester I took Biotech 1, and we used mini PCR a lot, and like micro pipetting was really important and everything. So yeah. And what did you think? It was super interesting, because I think I want to do that like in the future, like do something with biotech, so it was really helpful having that in school. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And I think what's interesting is that when you do a lot of that in that class, the more of that we can filter down, that changes the elective experience going forward. So That's great. great. I do want to say I had the opportunity to uh, go on the tour with the governor um, to some of the classes, and it was very, very impressive um, the, what the kids were doing in the classes. I, we saw the robotics mm -hmm. uh, class, and then we were in uh, Dr. Janini's class. And I think this where they were maybe using some of the mini PCR. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. And um, it was remarkable. Um, so thank you for all of your hard work on this. Uh, it's really just phenomenal to see how much this program has grown. So and thank you to your staff as well. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. No, I, I appreciate it, John. I know we joke from time to time, but you're really doing a very nice job with the uh, with the program. And I think the uh, the governor's visit um, really kind of just spotlighted everything that was happening. Um, the innovation pathways have come quite a ways and, you know, we're still expanding um, the dual enrollment program offerings. It's, it's really just a, a complete package, but it is nice to see how it does actually now kind of filter down to the um, 
middle schools and then even the elementary schools, you know, you can see the excitement of the kids. Um, we were over at the science fair at um, Center a few weeks ago, and uh, there's just a general excitement, which is uh, which is great. So you really are doing a great job, and I appreciate you um, sharing tonight. Awesome. Thank you. So, thank you. All right. Um, next item on the agenda this evening is our, uh, it's kind of a draft meeting schedule for next year um, for you to um, review and approve. It basically keeps the same format um, that we have in place, meeting the first and third uh, Tuesdays of each month at 6 o'clock. Good night. Have a good night. Night. Um, in July, the first uh, Tuesday is the fourth, so we wouldn't be meeting on the fourth, obviously. And we usually wait until that second meeting to do the uh, financials, at least uh, a good draft of the financials, and then we follow up in August if we have to with the finals. Um, the only other um, dates that change on this, uh, the two uh, vacation weeks, February and April. We don't meet during the vacation week. We meet the week after. And then you'll notice in April, instead of meeting the first Tuesday in April, um, we just push it to the second Tuesday because the first Tuesday is the election. Um, so we do our reorg meeting on the uh, second meeting in April. Um, and it actually kind of worked out well the way the school vacation weeks fell this year. So um, this is what I would propose as your uh, meeting schedule. And if you approve it, we'll get it posted to the website and communicate with um, Chancellor Telemedia so that all the meetings can be televised. We'll take a motion. I make a motion to accept the meeting schedule for the Chelmsford School Committee as presented. I second. Is there any questions? Any further discussion? No, just saying there's no other elections we have to worry about bumping into. Isn't that, isn't that a... Is there any... Um, like, I don't know. Uh, the primaries? Yeah, the primary. I don't even know what, what's I don't, know, I don't, I don't think, think we, we know, know yet. the dates are yet. No, we won't yeah. find okay, out. Okay, so all right. Yeah, because that's the only other... Fly anyway, yeah. sometimes. If, I mean, if something of a change, like we have the ability to just okay. add a meeting, mm -hmm. move it, but I think if we at least try to keep the consistency of this and then we'll make an adjustment if something came up. Well, that might happen November 7th. It's possible because that's election day. Yeah, I think it's this, it's like the September primaries that we don't, we sometimes find out very late uh, when those are going to be. Yeah, sometimes they change it too. Are people opposed to meeting on November 7th? Well, if it's an election, I don't think we can, right? Is it? You can't meet on an election. Yeah. I mean, as you said, we can wait until it comes closer and we can move it if we have to. So, so November 7th, change. Was it definitely an election day? No, I would have it in the September yeah. one. Right. I don't so know if I just give it to the next week. Yeah, we can certainly do that. So that would be the 14th and the 21st. Um, yeah, so if you if you want to move November to the um, 14th, it's, it's from the 7th to the 14th, I don't mind. It's up to you. Yeah, I just didn't want to have a conflict in it. Mm -hmm. okay. it, it. Let's do that because it wouldn't make sense to really move the 21st to the 28th because right. you're going to be butting up against the Thanks, meeting Thanks, anyway. Right. Yeah, and so Thanksgiving then. What if we just approve it as amended and we'll change the 7th to the 14th? Okay. I'm going to do another motion then. Yes, please. I would make a motion to accept the meeting schedule as amended for the Chelsea School Committee. Second. Um, thank you for that. Uh, Ketch, um, does anybody else have any questions or further discussion? All right. All those in favor? Aye. 4 0. Thank you. Uh, next up is just the liaison assignments. Sure. So I had mentioned ones. at the last meeting that um, we need to uh, uh, update our liaison uh, assignments. Um, so I've included um, this uh, current year's liaison assignments for people to take a look at. And if you could take a look at that and then get back to me, email me um, if you have any preferences um, or changes, um, that would be very, very helpful. Uh, what I would like to do is um, for the our um, school contacts, um, like our PTOs and things like that, and um, some of these other committees as well, um, to see these through the end of the school year. I know for PTOs, we only actually have one more meeting, I believe, in May. Most of them don't meet in June. Um, and so uh, if we could do that, that would be great. And then we'll start in July. Is that okay with everybody? Yep. All right. Sure. All right, so if people could just email me and let me know. So... 
on here, Donna, yes. things like um, the policies subcommittee, the strategic planning, that type of thing is not on here, right? Policy subcommittee is on there. Is on there, okay. Top, top one. Okay. Strategic planning, Jeff was on it, just. You and Jeff are, are on the steering committee? It's coming to an end, yeah. Yes. It's coming to an end. Yeah. That should be, I mean, that, that committee will actually probably wrap up by June 30th. Right. So I think we're okay to not have that on for next year. Okay. All right, are there any other uh, questions? All right, so if people could just look at this, please, I'd appreciate it. And then we'll update this for um, either the next meeting or the meeting after that to begin in July. All right. Yeah. And if you want, I can email you the... Um, it's just a Word document. If yes. you want to type in whoever, yep. just send it back to me or I can help you with it, whatever you want. Okay. Share it with me in Google if you want. What's that? You can just share it with me in, in Google. Okay. <laughs> it's a Word document, so I'll send it to you in Word. Uh, next up on the agenda this evening is acceptance of our uh, financial audit for fiscal 22. And I'll uh, turn this over to um, Joanna. Um, would you like to talk about it? Okay. Um, we had uh, Powers and Sutherland come in and do our fiscal year 22 end of year report audit. And then we also had them do the um, student activity audit for the high school. We've gotten the results from the end of year report audit and um, we have no findings. And I just would like to thank um, my team and all the department heads. And I say this um, Every year, and it, it's <coughs> just the audit, it's day in and day out uh, following our policies and our um, everybody being compliant and taking the time to be compliant, um, why we can achieve what we've achieved with our uh, finances and with our audits. Yeah. Now, Joanna and her group do a wonderful job. So, um, again, it's another finding free financial audit, which is great um, to their credit. I, um, I really appreciate the work. but. Um, yes, yeah, so it would just be a motion to accept this as a report of progress and place it on file. Make a motion to accept the FY 2022 Mass Desi end of the year financial audit report as presented. Second. Are there any questions or further discussion? Nope, just congratulations again. Yeah. Yes, congratulations. Thank you for all your hard work and for your department as for well. For the staff. All right. Um, all those in uh, do I have to be roll call? Thank you, roll call. No. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Or zero. And we'll stay with Joanna. Um, so this is our third quarter financial report for fiscal 23. So this is activity that started in July of 22 and goes right up through March 31st of 23. So we'll ask Joanna to walk us through that. These are the, the um, reports you receive regularly. So you have a, a memo that uh, talks about the Variances with the local operating budget. You have the um, year-to-date budget report through March. You have a grant and revolving fund summary. And then you have the student activity uh, accounts for the high school and both middle schools. So just a quarterly update. Not too, too much has changed from the last quarter. Just really the numbers are um, really solidifying since we're uh, through March. So our operating budget is $67.5 million for uh, this fiscal year. Um, we're favorable still in uh, classroom teachers, that category by $556,395 uh, for the same uh, reasons, primarily hiring teachers at less than uh, master step three. And then we also have some um, approved leave of absences uh, causing us to be favorable. And then the other thing that's changed is since all the um, collective bargaining agreements are complete, all of the monies held in those um, accounts for salary reserve have been uh, allocated to the labor accounts where the labor is actually charged. And then the same is true for the specialist teachers, so that's um, um, special ed, ELL, reading, that category is favorable for the similar reasons, $446,960. We're also favorable in employee separation costs by $95,374. Um, this hasn't changed from prior reports. This is because we paid retirees from uh, last year, instead of paying them in July, which is this fiscal year, we paid them in June. So those charges hit 
um, in fiscal 22, which allowed us to have a favorable variance this year. And then the special ed tuitions, it's just an overview. Um, we budget all of them um, in the local operating budget, and we expect that to be $5.4 million. And then we do the offset to the circuit breaker um, at the end of the year, and that offset has to be $2.5 million because we can't let our circuit breaker fund go above one year's um, actual revenue. And we did not budget for any school choice offset or Valley Collaborative tuition credit or any prepaid tuitions. But um, we ended up prepaying tuitions. Um, so fiscal 23 tuitions were prepaid last June. So we have known all year we are going to be favorable in this category because we prepaid. And um, right now, the bottom line is we're expecting that favorable variance to be about 1.3 million. And then the last category is just showing you the school choice revolving fund where we fund the one-to-one -one computer initiatives from. So we are getting that school choice revenue. And then the one-to-one -one initiatives is about 136,000 in those computer leases. So we expect that uh, fund to have a balance of 2.4 million. So that's the local operating budget. Um, and then it hasn't changed too much from when we did our uh, budget projection a couple meetings ago. And these favorable variances tie into um, that projection. And then we will be coming forward with some uh, recommendations for one-time purchases because of the favorable variance. Any questions on the local operating budget? Just, I, and I know we're in great shape, but I just want yeah. just question on the Munis report and just yeah. all the different. Sure. Um, on page 11, yeah. um, there's a line in from McCarthy Equipment that's at a high percentage. I just want, and it's not a huge number. Oh, but I just um, wonder, wonder what that was. Yep, that is, we are going to, um, we're going to be coming forward with a fitness center at McCarthy mm -hmm. at the next meeting. To get started on that, we had to do the purchase order to um, clean out that it's the locker room, the girls' locker room. So we did that over April vacation. Okay. So uh, we went ahead and did the purchase order so that we could um, reserve that contractor's time to get that work done. Okay. So that's what that is. So when we come forward, you're going to see we're going to kind of split that between um, PE and athletics um, are kind of going to share the cost of the benefit of that um, fitness center. Okay. And the only other one was on page 19, just the maintenance of grounds ones, just there. Yes, and this one, um, so overall in the budget book, maintenance of grounds and custodial is on the same page. So actually the category is still favorable because custodial is favorable. Okay, so they're running together. Yep. Okay. So they're running together. So it's um, my preference is to record it where it belongs rather than where the budget is. Okay. Um, but we did buy um, some like outside equipment, snow raiders, things like that, and it better categorized in this category rather than up in custodial. Okay. Um, the next one is the grant revolving funds. So, Ooh, oh, I'm sorry. Can I go ahead. This for of course. Just one second. Yep. Um, every time we get this report, an implication I keep on thinking about is the fact that um, we have this variance on classroom teachers, and it seems to be that it's because we're getting new people in at a different step, at, you know, a lower step than you know maybe somebody who exited mm -hmm. the system. So I'm thinking that, and maybe I'm wrong, that that means we probably are getting less experienced folks in, uh, replacing people who have quite a bit of experience in the system. Um, and I think if, if we can't, it, this is, it has nothing to do with how you're keeping the budget or whatever, but the implication for us in terms of for the system long term. And I'm wondering if at some point, we can kind of look overall 
to see what's happening in the system in terms of turnover. We get the personnel reports and those things, but just the bigger picture um, so that we can all see where things stand at the different levels, especially after we go through this whole uh, restructuring at the middle school um, so that level, so that we just see what are we getting mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, whatever salary <coughs> we're paying, where our staff is at, and so on. Um, so I, I personally think that that would be important for us as a committee mm -hmm. to look at at some point. Because I love having, you know, more money that right. we can then use, but right. I just don't want in the long term for that to be um, something that hurts us. Right. No, I hear what you're, what you're saying. I think there's um, two things to consider, though. When we build the budget for the following year, like mm -hmm. the fiscal 24, um, and we know that there's a teacher who's retiring, we already budget in what the assumed kind of savings is going to be because it's very unlikely if you have a teacher going out at step 12, you're not likely going to hire a teacher at step 12 to keep going on. So someone's going to come in at a lesser step. What we have found historically is if we budget at step three, that's a good average. Now, there are some positions, we were looking at some recent hires, that might be coming in at step you know, five, six, or seven. You know, that certainly mm -hmm. happens. There are other positions that um, you might actually attract um, a new person coming out of school that might come in on step one or step two. Um, so that does happen. But we actually already account for that when we're putting our budget together. A large piece of that variance there is, and Joey, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but a, the significant piece is actually our own staff who request and get approved to take an unpaid leave of absence. So we have basically budgeted their full salary, but something has happened in their personal life where they need to take a leave of absence mm -hmm. and it's unpaid. So the money is still allocated to the account, but we're not going to spend it because we're going to hire a long-term sub from a different account, a different portion of the budget, to actually fill that role. So you may see, uh, it doesn't happen too often, but you might see like the long-term sub account actually go over what we've budgeted because the money that's actually paying for the position is kind of locked into the actual teacher salary. Mm -hmm. So that's a bigger reason why that number is a variance. It's leaves of absence as opposed to um, we've already kind of accounted for the differential you'd see in a teacher retiring at top step and a new person coming in at a lower step. But if you'd like at the end of the hiring season, I could give you like a little analysis of the, I think we, it's probably a dozen or so positions. Mm -hmm. I could show you what the person kind of went out at and what the new person came in at, mm -hmm. if that's helpful to you. Yeah, and I would guess there's no way of avoiding and having the long-term subs and so on, but there is a substantial impact on the system when you have a tremendous number of long-term um, subs. And right. if that's happening a lot, in a particular year, and it's always happening a lot, mm -hmm. maybe we take a look at that as well and see if there's a, a, a better assured way that we'll have good quality uh, long-term subs mm -hmm. in the pipeline if we need them. Just, I think it would be a good thing to, to just examine the whole thing mm -hmm. and make sure that, because I think this is happening in a lot of districts where it's, it's just what's out there. Right. What can we get in terms of uh, staff? I think we're very lucky. I think right. we, have, we still have a very good staff. But uh, going long term, this is mm -hmm. going to be more and more um, of a potential impact. Sure. Yeah. I don't want to go too far adrift on this, but you know, I, I do want to say this um, you know, on behalf of our younger teachers. It really is quite remarkable um, um, the things that they can do, oh, yeah. okay, with technology and and it's it's, I mean it's it's really great to see they they are much more nimble when it comes to those kinds of things, and I think we do a good job of taking care of our younger teachers by providing them with a mentor, um, building administrative support, and then our curriculum coordinators as well. I mean, you're right. You know, experience is, is a great thing. But when I see some of the skills that these younger teachers are coming in with, it's really quite impressive. And then we just need to make sure that we're giving them the support so that they can, right. you know, um, continue to develop their instructional skills and classroom right. management skills and things like that. And the only way you're going to learn that is to be on the job. Right. Um, but um, I just, you know, I'm in awe sometimes. I don't know, Dennis, I mean, you're a long-term teacher, but it's really quite remarkable when you see some of the skills that these kids are coming in with. Definitely. You know? Yeah.
teach us old dogs a few tricks. Yeah, I know. It's, yeah. It's, yeah, for sure. But, yeah. you know. Can I just, Maria, I think to clarify what you're asking, I think you were not looking at so much from the financial point, right. but to uh, how is the staff comprised? Like right. how many brand new teachers compared, compared to how many experienced right. teachers and what does the, right. the makeup of the staff look like as opposed to what the finances of right. that? Is right. that what you it's were just asking? The, every time, yeah. right. I see this because of this report. In mm -hmm. other words, that's how I'm seeing it. I'm not seeing it from looking at the entire personnel and mm -hmm. where we are. And I think it would be good to get a deeper picture of that and have these kinds of discussions because maybe uh, the support that we're giving to the newer teachers, there might be additional things we can pay for and so on mm -hmm. that also comes from these one-time spendings that mm -hmm. are part of this that I don't know about and so on. Or And I don't have to know everything, but just right. to make sure that that's... How it is, and we look at the district as a whole, right? And I, and I think that that's a a good point. And thank you for the clarification. Um, you know, I just want to make sure that uh, you know. I think you know. Obviously, a mix is a great thing. You know, yeah. we have to have the the youngsters coming in with Absolutely. the energy, and, and as I said, these newer skills. And we also have to have the experienced teachers who mm -hmm. can guide these newer teachers. You know, through the process of becoming really good educators. Yes, and, and please don't take this wrong. I, I, I'm hoping I have a, a new teacher coming along in my own family, and I'm so looking forward to it. Um, I love, you know, what they bring yeah. to That's the great. table, uh, but it's just making also sure that we are appropriately allocating for bringing mm -hmm. all of that together, the experience and the novelty mm -hmm. and, and so on. I think it's important in the system for us to look at that, our policies, our things, everything in, in respect to that. Didn't you just love how your budget went into that? I'm so, sorry. <laughs> it is all connected. Thank but you. But it's all important. Thank you. The next report is the grant and revolving fund summary. So the top part is the um, grants from uh, DESE, the entitlement grants. Yeah. Um, the middle part is kind of the uh, private grants. And then the second page is the revolving fund. Everyone's on, uh, uh, from what I see, on track to implement their plan. The financial aspect is uh, just one kind of um, item on the dashboard to see how they're doing with implementing their plans. And all the revolving funds are, um, you know, none are in deficit and, you know, on track to remain that way this year. Can I just ask on the, yep. on the other grant funds, in just the math, okay, with the, uh -huh. which is ironically, the Innovation Pathways, um, one, it has a budget of 9107 we spent 85 whatever yeah have 500 left but then we're 90 thousand dollars in the hole so this particular grant is a reimbursement grant where you request the revenue at the end of the grant okay okay um, all, many of the other ones you request monthly and there's like a little formula you put in how much have I spent how much do I think I'm going to spend in the net 30 day, next 30 days, and they send you a little bit of money each month. Uh, this particular one is a subgrant award from the city of Lowell, and what we do in June is I send them a little set of documents that says, here's what we spend, right on a munis and everything, and I send it to them, and then they will send us exactly what we spent. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Yep. Yep. And then the last uh, set of reports are the student activity um, accounts, so the clubs, the sports, um, the high school is has a balance of two hundred and sixty-four thousand dollars with all the you know, seventy-five clubs or so. Uh, the McCarthy is at close to thirty-eight thousand, and I think I lost the Parker. I think it's at around fifty, forty-six something. 56. Oh, thank you. 56. How are they going to handle when they... Yeah, so that's uh, how are we going to handle it. <laughs> yes. how, are we, how are you going to handle it? So we yeah. talked to the auditors a little bit about that and um, uh, some ideas. So it's going to come down to club by club by club. So, you know, it's probably going to be, you know... Um, most of it stays put, but some of the grade level stuff switches and then uh, I'll put together a recommendation 
for um, the auditors and for Dr. Lang and this group. And then if they uh, agree that it's well documented and fair, then we just um, um, we'll have to do some transfers, really do the transfers between the bank accounts and then um, uh, reflect it all on the reports. Okay. Okay, great. Does great. Have questions? Or? Yeah, no, just, I mean, we're in very good financial shape as, um, as usual, which is good. Um, you know, it is coming into the fourth quarter now, right? So uh, this is when we kind of do some of those one-time recommendations. You'll start to see those at the next couple of meetings, and we'll detail a uh, spending plan for you for fiscal 24 if we're going to um, prepay any more tuitions, if we're going to do any more set aside for that special ed reserve fund. Um, again, the one-time purchasing that'll all be coming up over the next couple of meetings, but uh, we're in good we're in good shape. Thank you. Good to hear. Okay. Just maybe a, a vote to approve it. Yes. Uh, as a report of progress. progress. Oh, okay. uh, I make a motion to accept the FY 2023 third quarter financial report as presented. I second. Okay. Any other first or questions or concerns? All those in favor? Aye. Right. 0 Thank you. Thank you. And the uh, sixth item on the agenda this evening is um, I had originally had it voted as an approval of the uh, contract for the special ed transportation provider, mm. in which Joanna has um, attached is kind of an outline of the summary um, with regard to where we're at. And between now and the next meeting, we'll work with um, Andy's office to actually generate the uh, contract. So the contract will come forward to you to formally be voted. But um, in the end of the process, we ended up with just the one one bid, which we're not surprised by. But um, I'll ask Joanna to just kind of walk us through the process just so that you can know what um, transpired. And then uh, likely at the next meeting, we'll have the uh, contract for you to actually vote on and uh, approve and sign. This is for the Special Education Out of District Student Transportation Services. And we um, did kind of a little regional bid with Bill Ricca and Tuxbury, and um, so that's a pretty defined timeline and process. So we put out the bid on March 13th, and six um, providers requested the bid packet. We had a pre-bid conference on March 21st here, and then on March 22nd we sent out the answers to the Q&A, and then on. Um, a little early, actually, we received the one bid um, on March 30th. The actual date, the bids were due were April 4th, so we opened the bid April 4th at 2 p.m. And Trombley Motor Coach Services was the uh, bidder. The other two districts also have a copy of the bid. As Dr. Lang said, we'll ask our legal counsel to draft the three-year contract with an option for a one-year renewal in years four and another one in year five. And we'll ask you to uh, sign the contract at one of the meetings in May. Did it, without getting into it, fall into where you kind of projected it to, to fall when you did the budget? Um, yeah, I mean, monetarily, you will be able to incorporate it within the budget. I think the... Um, um, and I think a lot of school districts in the area are feeling this. The frustration is that we just don't have competitive bidding when it comes to school bus transportation. So whether it's big bus or special ed buses, uh, busing, um, it's just very limited with regard to um, even getting vendors to come, you know, to a, um, um, a, a bid opening or a, an announcement and then actually to have them submit. It's just become such a niche uh, thing that, you know, regionally these independent um, companies are, conglomerates, depending on how you look at them, uh, basically kind of have the market on the area. And, you know, districts don't receive competitive bidding. So it'll fall in line with, you know, we'll, we'll be able to, um, to budget for it. It's just a little frustrating to not have there be any competition. Is um, this a new company or the one we've been working with? No, it's the one we've had, yeah. you know, okay. for a long, long yeah. time. Um, and they really, they're the, the company in the area. You know, and I think districts and like, you know, Joanna um, obviously was good with this, but uh, taking the lead, even trying to partner with other districts to make it like more enticing or to try to get best pricing. So we did this joint bid with Baricker and uh, Tuxbury and, um, 
you know, again, we, we may have gotten better pricing than we would have gotten if we just went out on our own, uh, but the result is still just one, one vendor. Now, I have to say, honestly, I think they've been doing a, a pretty good job, particularly coming out of COVID. COVID was very difficult for the transportation companies just to retain staff. They have the same issues we do. I think um, on the this is the special ed front, so this is the smaller minibuses that um, transport the CHIP students. A lot of the vans that will transport either in district or like to out of district placements. Um, and overall, they do a very good job with that. I think I'd just personally like to see a little bit more um, competition just to keep um, keep pricing in check. Service-wise, I don't have a big issue with the uh, service. It's more um, just the lack of competition competitively on the uh, financials. Mm. So, um, so that'll be before you in, um, in May. Right. Thank you. And that's all I had for tonight. All right. Does anybody have any liaison reports? <clears throat> Just a couple of updates. Um, for McCarthy and Center, I've combined. They have that junk day coming up, the recycle day, May 13th, yep. Saturday, May 13th. And um, just want to comment on the middle schools. I think they're, it's at the end of the year, and they're starting to plan activities that bring the, the PTOs together and welcoming the students from the very, you know, the opposite schools into uh, each other's bodies there, which is great. And for the high school, um, the um, big moment coming up is the after prom, mm -hmm. which is May 30th, uh, that, that night. Um, and they are always looking for volunteers, so they're mentioning that again. And I think as a commencement came out, which is going to be June 3rd, but uh, it's that whole week is their activities, and May 30th is their after prom. Anybody else? I do have a question on the um, junk day, recycle day. Um, we've had our residents in the past ask if something could be posted to some of the popular um, social media sites. Okay. Uh, because so many residents in town outside of the district really like to, um, b you know, bring their stuff. Uh, and they just like a little advance notice so that they can plan. Okay, I'm going to tell them. So, yeah, anything that they could do to post that um, would be greatly appreciated. Okay. It's very popular. It, it really is. <laughs> and I think that that's why people reach out and say, can you when put some it? notice up about when this is going to be? It's so. really amazing. All right, uh, does anybody have anything that they would like included on any upcoming <coughs> agendas? We do have um, Day on the Hill a week from Thursday. Um, I know that some of us are still planning on attending. Um, I believe the House is meeting this week on their budget, so uh, that may be timely mm -hmm. um, in terms of meeting with our representatives to talk about uh, the Chapter 70 funding um, and some of the other issues uh, that we have concerns around, um, you know, related to uh, new construction. And um, one other thing, too, I, I don't know if people remember, too, we were also at one point talking to them about um, looking at... Uh, other venues for voting rather than in our schools. Yeah. So that might be something else that we want to talk to them about as well. Yeah, and I, I remember Representative Arciero was one of the um, sponsors of, the, of a bill to allow uh, voting in venues that serve alcohol, but they just they wouldn't serve alcohol during that time, right. which would open up possibilities like clubs and so on for voting so. um, in communities instead of being at the schools. And at one time, PTOs, we all signed on to this thing and we sent it in and it's gone nowhere. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if there's anything else that people can think of that they would like included as talking points uh, for our meeting, um, please feel free to email me and I'll put those together for the group that goes up um, to the State House on the 4th. I'll um, confirm with Robin tomorrow just to make sure that we have everyone registered okay. that is going to go. And I'll reach out if I didn't have... Um, the sign-ups for, for oh, where we're going. The only other thing I wanted to just mention for you, just um, planning for the next couple of meetings. So we do have a meeting next Tuesday because we're already into um, to May. And uh, we do have um, John Kim from District Management Group is going to come and present the uh, Special Education Opportunities Review findings. So that is going to be a lengthy presentation. Um, 
so that is going to be the bulk of our meeting for next week. If there are other things you'd like, please let me know. But just I wanted to kind of forecast that for you. We'll do the special ed opportunity review that evening, and then um, possibly the security uh, audit review at the second meeting in May. So these these are all kind of coming to a head. Uh, but we will have the special ed review next uh, Tuesday. That's been confirmed. Do you Did want to we do one do this? time? Oh, sorry. I'm sorry. One time things. First meeting, second meeting. Um, we're shooting for at least a good list for next for the good start of it for next Tuesday okay. and then there may be some you know towards the end of May or early June like some final things but um, no the we're going to try to do a good bulk of the uh, projects next Tuesday sorry about that um, the security audit do are we doing that in executive session first um, yeah so I'm going to still need to just kind of finalize that with the group but uh, the school committee would convene an executive session to kind of hear a report review it um, and we'll figure out what piece can be public and which piece can't um, but I just wanted to kind of forecast for you that that is coming along for late May. Okay. All right. Is there anything else? Do you have something? I just wanted to uh, mention this. Thank you very much. I think Donna and Dennis and anyone who's worked on this committee for a long time, there was a lot of work done on Chapter 70 um, in past years. It was mentioned yesterday at the... Um, you know, at the town meeting, and uh, it really has a profound effect. Uh, the fact that the town is changing, too, and the composition of the town makes a huge difference. But um, all that work that you did is paying off, and sometimes it just takes years and years. Mm -hmm. um, but it's uh, really important uh, to point out that slowly but surely uh, you get there. And uh, we can't forget how important it is to keep in touch with the state. And uh, do our do our work. <clears throat> Absolutely, and I, you know, I think that uh, we, I think it would be remiss if, if I didn't mention, you know, some previous committee members like Angie Toronto, Kathy Duffett, Sheila Pachette, Evelyn Thorin, who I can remember joining up at the state house back in two thousand four and five, and they were there long before I was Mary Franz. You know, really uh, trying to push for um, you know, on behalf of Chelmsford uh, for more Chapter seventy money. So it's been. Uh, yeah, a very long time coming for sure uh, with a lot of people involved and, and I'm sure even more than I, I, I mentioned be, but uh, it was a real um, uh, collective effort um, and so hopefully you know we're going to see some I don't know if we're going to get it all but I, right. I would you know I'm just glad to see it moving in the right direction Thank you. so it's terrific all right. Uh, I don't believe that we have anybody else for public comment this evening. We don't. Uh, in our second public comment input session. So, um, and did anybody receive any emails that are been requested to be read into the minutes? No. no. Okay. Then with that, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. I make a motion to adjourn. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Four zero. Thank you, everybody.